Thank you, Richard, for uh, for the introduction. And it's really good to be back uh, giving a follow-up on um, the case that we uh, presented at uh, Rio 2022. Um, so we showed a case um, using the novel focal lattice tip catheter or the ferro catheter. And um, we are passionate about uh, minimizing fluoroscopy or not using fluoroscopy and not using lead for our ablations. Um, so uh, let me take a, a minute and kind of go over how our patient's doing. These are my uh, disclosures. So um, our patient uh, that we presented at Rio 2023 was a 72-year-old uh, with uh, hypertension, CAD, uh, had persistent atrial fibrillation, and had multiple heart failure admissions uh, prior to seeing us. Uh, the injection fraction at that time was noted to be about 40 to 45%. Um, had had two attempts at cardioversion uh, with a high dose of sotalol and ticosin, uh, was being managed uh, more conservative uh, conservatively at that point, um, but was started on a drone, was maintaining sinus rhythm, and was referred to us to be enrolled in the uh, uh, IDE trial called the Sphere Persistent AF uh, IDE trial that was evaluating uh, this novel focal lattice tip catheter, uh, the Sphere 9 catheter, uh, the trial was a pros is a prospective multi-sender randomized trial that had one-to-one -one randomization between the Sphere 9 catheter, which was investigational, which is still um, not FDA approved in the U.S., um, and uh, comparing to the Thermocol Smart Touch SF uh, catheter. The patients were actually uh, uh, blinded, uh, so single-blinded. Obviously, the physicians were not. Um, we were looking at both safety and effectiveness of the Sphere 9 catheter the mapping system, which is the FARA mapping system, and the mapping software, which is a PRISM uh, software. So um, we have uh, seen the patient uh, a couple times since then, as, especially as, since the patient is uh, being aggressively followed as part of the, the trial. Uh, uh, they tolerated the procedure very well, was sent home the same day, which is kind of our routine uh, for all of our AF ablations. We do uh, per close uh, for our uh, ablations. So uh, patients ambulate pretty quickly and uh, are able to go home usually within about two to three hours. Um, the patient's amiodrone was discontinued on the day of the procedure, um, and the patient was started on low-dose sodalol uh, initially for that first uh, few uh, weeks uh, post-procedure, um, was continued on oral anticoagulation. Uh, we've now seen the patient back at their six-month follow-up, and they're still maintaining sinus rhythm. Uh, currently, they're completely off their uh, sodalol, uh, this continue to remain on oral anticoagulation. Uh, as part of the clinical trial, the patient actually gets weekly transmissions uh, through the cardio device. Um, so for the last six months, uh, they have done really well and stayed in sinus rhythm. Uh, we recently had an echocardiogram uh, that demonstrated an, an, an improvement in ejection fraction. Um, also, the patient's not had any more heart failure hospitalization. So uh, really a, a very good outcome for this patient um, we feel like, you know, this patient potentially would have benefited from an ablation way before uh, getting to the third antiarrhythmic, but, uh, um, you know, better late than never. Uh, we are definitely doing well, um, and the patient is um, uh, following up, still continues to follow up for the yearly uh, visit as part of the trial. That's great, Debbie. I mean, it's an amazing result because this is exactly the sort of patient I really wouldn't want to do because I know your chances of success are so low they fail i mean do you think failure to cardiovert is a marker of outcome does that predict outcome if you can't get them back into normal rhythm with a dc cardioversion i mean i think it always it makes me worry uh that i have not been able to cardiovert the patient uh the patient also uh, would stay in sinus for a little bit but would have recurrence was the biggest issue so at least they demonstrated sinus in this case uh, but on the drone, this patient did stay in sinus rhythm, uh, which was kind of the uh, the marker. We actually talked about pace and ablate strategy in this patient, uh, especially after they failed two cardioversions and had um, um, and had a, a, de a decline in the ejection fraction and heart failure hospitalization. Uh, but the patient really um, felt like they they felt the best during that short one to two week window they were in sinus rhythm after the first two attempts and really wanted us to try uh, sinus rhythm first. And obviously our backup was going to be, you know, pace and ablate. Uh, but it was a patient that actually pushed me to uh, going the rhythm control strategy. And and you uh, absolutely smashed that case. I mean, it, it looked as though it was a one size fits all. You It was so quick for you to isolate those veins. 
but we talked about how you would select technology and would the I'm going to ask both you and Julian about this. Does does the patient presentation make you change your strategy as opposed to so presumably a a, a one size fits all limits the size of the lesion set you can produce, whereas with this you can create much wider lines. Would that influence your choice of technology depending on the patient and their their presentation? Um, I, I, it's a great question. I you know I, I agree. I think. The the one shot catheters, you know, I mean, they're they're definitely capable of performing a pulmonary vein isolation, but really, I feel like they're not as flexible uh, when it comes to other lesion sets, especially if you have to do a linear linear ablation. And I think we we still kind of, um, I think we still struggle with what is the ideal lesion set for a for a, for a patient, especially this patient that I would probably say is more of a late persistent patient. Uh, and you know, when we when we map, at least for me, uh, the primary strategy is PVI, but I had a good feeling that I was going to go outside of the PVs in this patient, uh, you know, most likely concerning for flutters and things that could potentially pop up. And so that was one of the reasons why I wanted to have a little more flexibility. And I think uh, the beauty of the, you know, the lattice tip catheter, it's number one, it's got a big footprint. It allows me to go between, uh, you know, have a point by point ablation, but go between RF and PF and kind of not worry, still have the safety aspects to the catheter with the PF, but also use RF in those areas where I need to, but also do linear lesions if I needed to. So the flexibility definitely gave me the advantage in this case. Debbie, uh, great case and congratulations to the um, excellent outcome for you and your patient. Um, as you put it, and I think also this is part of the limitation, we still refer always to STAR AF um, to trial and additional ablation beyond the PVs did not really translate into any benefit. So maybe, as you put it, um, the combination of uh, RF and PFA ablation um, and the, the the information based on the um, mapping system may allow us to really to tailor individually um, the, the, the best lesion set, which then hopefully will remain durable as well over time. I agree. I think just having that, uh, having that, um, you know, mapping, you know, simultaneously map, being able to map with the catheter. It's a map and a blade strategy, right? So the, so the same lattice tip catheter is able to map. And so um, the way, you know, I've kind of, you know, decided on my lesion set is based off of SCAR, um, based off the voltage map. Uh, and uh, I, I agree that the, we have not seen data or enough data to see go outside of the PVs, but uh, it's kind of hard to ignore uh, LA SCAR uh, when we know absolutely. And, they could be and, and may, may I ask you if you had to or if you um, decide what regions are you using RF and what regions do you prefer? Oh, what you were. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I was. Yeah, so yeah, a lot connected. Going between our. What? Thing, what, yeah, what? I agree. In what scenario do you actively decide to use PFA, PFA versus RF uh, in a certain region, and um, what are your personal experience with regards to durability of linear lesions in the atrium? Um, so, two great questions. Um, so at least in this trial, while we used uh, this catheter, um, I heavily rely on ice uh, to look at uh, the tissue that I'm, I'm ablating. Uh, so the thicker the tissue, um, I prefer uh, RF. So in the left atrium, um, the areas that I targeted RF were almost always along the anterior uh, ridge uh, between the pulmonary veins and the appendage, um, and also along the anterior septum, uh, along the right superior pulmonary vein, as long as I could make sure that the phrenic nerve uh, was not uh, uh, close by. So we still did a kind of pace mapping for the phrenic, stayed off the phrenic, used RF. If the phrenic was close by, um, in those scenarios, I, I, I did use PF in that situation. Um, posterior wall was generally PF 100% uh, of the time, uh, mainly to avoid the any issues with the esophagus. Um, when, if, if, when we did the uh, CTI line. Um, obviously, there's you know we we had started to hear a lot more about the coronary, the vasospasm issues and stuff. And so, 
for two reasons, I mainly used RF along the CTI and mitral lines. Um, number one, I, I felt like if I did PF and I got block, I, I needed to be sure that I actually had block. So I would start with RF, uh, especially for cable track asphyxiasis. I would start with RF. And once I had block, uh, I had no issue switching over to PF if I needed to. Um, and also uh, along the area, along the tricuspid atlas, or along the area, the mitral area, along the circumflex, I would uh, I use mostly RF and not PF. Great. Thanks, Debbie. Well, we must uh, move on. That's a wonderful case and an amazing outcome. That's brilliant. Well done. Now I'll be discussing the follow-up from the case I performed, uh, cryoablation with a new transeptal access system at St. Bart's in London.